Hello. Uh, now I'm, I have to do a sound check first. So this is some um, housekeeping. My name is Sarah Mayer Cox, and I'm going to be hosting this Writers Victoria webinar on mentor texts, learning from the best. So um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking to you today. They are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respect to their elders past and present and any elders who are joining us today in this webinar. In case some of you have never been part of a webinar, webinar before, um, here's what's going to happen. Oh, great, I can see some people. Hi, Jake, hi, Suya. Hi, Scott. Um, here's what's going to happen. I'm reading from my little shiny list, you can see. You should be able to see and hear me and I'm going to have some slides appear on the screen. Uh, and there are handouts uh, that we'll go through in this section and there'll be time for you to ask questions. And um, we're going to do the questions as we go and I'll try and um, uh, keep an eye on what's going on down in the left of my screen. Uh, so you can ask or answer questions by opening the questions pane, wherever that is, is on your screen. Um, you can also find this along the toolbar at the right hand side of your screen. Our tech support will pass these questions on to me during the webinar. So the lovely um, Diane and Emma are standing by waiting to help. Let's test that now to make sure you can hear me. Why not type hello into the question box? Well, some of you, Jake doesn't have to, Sue doesn't have to, Scott doesn't have to. Hi Kerry uh, and Lara and Brooke and Ash and Merrin and Bonnie. So I think that's pretty much there. Um, don't worry if you miss anything. This webinar is being recorded and the video will be sent round to everyone after we've finished. If you have any technical problems, just call Deanne or um, Emma uh, at the number on your email. So let's begin mentor text. Um, so my name's Sarah Mayer Cox and uh, I'm a primary teacher by training. I work at a university in rural Victoria at La Trobe University. Currently I'm doing my PhD looking at children's illustrators and illustration um, and I'm also very involved in the Children's Book Council and Australian Literacy Educators Association and I do some, some, some consulting in school. So, do you oh, you there? Um, so, what I, the reason I wanted to use mentor texts is I've found as a teacher, standing on the, sh the shoulders of giants is a fantastic way of really honing your writing and stopping and reflecting on your writing and thinking about what's great about it, what do I need to improve on, how am I going to get there. Uh, it's a very commonly used tool in schools, uh, especially in secondary schools, when you're trying to get children going from that sort of basic writing uh, and to really encourage those in your class who are going to end up being people like you, real writers. Um, and so I, I've just gone on using it because I, I think it's fantastic. Um, and uh, so what we're going to look at today is if I can make this work, I think I push that button. No, maybe I push. I'm a Mac girl, I have to admit. So I'm speaking to you from a, a computer that's not a Mac. Um, so if I push that, no, if I push that button. Oh, here we go. So this is what I'm going to be talking about with you 
today. Uh, the relevance of mentor texts to your development as an early or emerging writer, and I've pitched this at a really low level, and I'm really sorry if um, I, I don't mean to cause any offence. Um, if it's all too basic, just um, let me know and I will crank it up a few levels. Um, how to find some mentor texts, um, how to deconstruct and mine te mentor texts. So that's what we're going to spend the majority of um, this morning on. And then how to reflect on your own writing by comparing and contrasting your work to mentor texts. So first of all, I probably need to tell you um, what is, you know, what do we um, think of as being a, um, uh, a mentor text. And a mentor text is really just um, an exemplar of some aspect or element or device of writing that you are trying to wrangle in your own work. Um, there's a, a, somebody told me once that hundreds of years ago when musicians were learning how to compose music, they were required to copy out the sheet notation of music because there was this belief and research is now showing it to be true actually that there is a belief about the connection between handwriting something and um, it going into your long-term memory where you can then do something with it. Um, so uh, I've never got children to or any student I've worked with, I've never got them to sit and copy out passages of text, but I know um, that some people, some poets do copy out poetry or specific lines of poetry that they really love because they've said, um, um, oh, can we play the slide show full screen? Absolutely we can. Um, so, Scott, I will just click the projector screen icon in the bottom bar. Thank you. Uh, no, not that one. Maybe Deanne or Emma is going to come and rescue me. Hmm. Sorry about this. Uh, Just going to type to them. Type my message here. Not sure how to make the screen on screen. Help. Um, oh, and now you've been able to see the question, I think. Try clicking on from current slide. Yeah, second icon in toolbar at the top of the screen. Oh, that's what's going wrong. My big fat face is in front of it. Um, oh, how's that? Is that better? Oh, no audio here, Lynette. Um, it's telling me that the... Um, thanks, Scott. That's just what I needed, a big yay. Um, okay, Lynette, can you still hear? Can you hear or not? Um, oh, Bonnie, thank you. I'll tell my children you think I'm perfect. They know I'm not. Um, alrighty. So... Let's, now I need to go back because I've, um, okay, so a mentor text. Um, Lynette, how's that doing for you? Um, can you let me know if you can hear? Oh, of course you can't. Um, uh, oh. Oh, I cannot type. Lynn at, I hate misspelling people's names. Lynn at, 
can you hear me now? Enter. Send all. Um, okay, I might just keep going if that's all right. Um, oh, still no audio. Oh, um, Lynette. Oh, someone's helping you, hopefully. Okay. Um, is it okay that I keep going? Um, all right. So, um, okay, I'll keep going. Righto. So, um, hi. Yeah, apparently um, one of the... The people in the webinar, Lynette, can't hear. Oh, yes, um, I've just contacted uh, her about uh, possibly her mic being off. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. Um, so I can handle that and can you please um, oh, please please great. So Lynette's going to try the phone. Yeah. Yeah, sure. fabulous. Okay. Are you all good on your end? Yep, all okay. good now. Yep, yep. fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's plough on. Sorry, Lynette, someone will come and rescue you shortly. Uh, so let's, oh, next slide. Okay, so you've probably all heard um, the, the idea that to be a great writer, you need to be a great reader. So when I'm working with students, what I'm trying to help them understand is that reading and writing are two halves of the same coin. So we need to read as if we're writers and write as if we're readers. Now, for you being writers, you want to be able to um, write so that you're hooking your readers in. Now, what I want you to do uh, right now, I presume you've got um, pads of paper or a little notebook with you. Uh, can you just write down one thing that you are trying to wrangle with your writing at the moment? Now, it might be writing in general or it might be a particular piece of writing that you're working on at the moment. Just write down one thing. And if you're happy um, to share that one thing um, in the question box, um, type it in. Don't worry if you don't want to. Um, I don't want anyone to share anything that they don't want to disclose. And just keep it as simple as possible. So if you could do that. Okay. Ah, oh, redrafting my novel. Nadia, let's just start really big, shall we, Nadia? Um, okay, so redrafting, we're breaking it down. So obviously, um, in Nadia's case, she's got writing there and now she needs to work out what's working and what's not working. Uh, Meryn said, what is the right amount of description? Okay, I find, uh, especially when I'm working with children and young adult texts, less is always more. It's really powerful and I'm terrible. I put far too many adjectives and adverbs in and it just waters it down. Um, if you think about it as like um, it's having the ratio of cordial to water, uh, the more water you add, which it, the water is the adjectives and the adverbs, um, the, the weaker the cordial gets. Um, so shifting between tenses is another thing that someone said. Oh, yay, Lynette, you can hear on the phone. Fantastic. Welcome. Hello. Um, uh, Jessica's saying at the moment I'm trying to write a scene in my novel where the protagonist finds out something vital and then has to confront her mother. Okay, so... Um, Maybe for you, you're going to solve that problem through dialogue or maybe you're going to solve that problem through foregrounding something. Um, uh, obviously, I can't get too specific because I've not seen the work. Um, 
Yeah, um, Sue has talked about how fast the narrative goes. And of course, sometimes you want to slow it right down, sometimes you want to speed it up, and there are lots of different ways of doing that. Um, Linda's comment, how to tell a really big story through an individual perspective. Um, there are lots of different ways of deciding on what voice you're going to use. So I think what I'll do is, um, uh, I often can't tell when a poem is finished and sometimes I overwrite. Fantastic, Desmonda. Um, I've actually got an example of a poem um, for you um, from one of Australia's top, uh, in fact, she's probably the, the foremost literary poet for uh, children and young adults. Um, her name is Lorraine Marwood. Um, and I'm going to talk you through that shortly. Um, yeah, dialogue um, is a really big thing that lots of people have problem with. Um, I find I'm writing the story at breakneck speed. Great. So, Suya, you, you, that is fantastic. You, you're, um, the fact that you're a self-reflective writer is wonderful. Uh, and you're aware of that, that pace and needing to slow it down. So um, without sounding like I'm your third grade teacher, um, the way that I like to use um, these mentor texts is, and I, I find they work really well if you've got a, a very um, constructive or supportive writing group or even... Uh, if you write in a pair, um, find it, choose what you're working on, um, and then find um, a text that you feel as you can learn from. Uh, read it silently first, but then read it aloud, because the best reading is the reading that's done aloud. And even when we read in our heads, we are actually reading aloud to ourselves. Uh, it's wonderful when you can read that text with other people. Uh, and that's why a lot of the time in schools we do uh, choral reading or reading aloud because that's that, it's that sense of um, turning the work almost into um, a reading of a screenplay or a reading of a play. And what you're trying to do or what every reader is trying to do is, or every writer is trying to do is not send their readers to sleep, but really make them feel that they're in this um, completely immersive um, world uh, and and um, the walls in front and to the side and at the back. If I turned to any point, I would know exactly what it looked like, felt like um, the textures, the, 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 the temperature, the sounds, the smells, all of that is there and you're trying to capture that and distill it down in, in your writing. Okay, um, so that that's the first thing. Um, then how do I go to the next slide? Oop, sorry. Next slide. So how do you choose your mentor text? I find, and you'll see shortly, um, I've built up um, a scrapbook. Um, or a journal of mentor texts. And I find that the shorter, the better, because you need to be able to dive into all aspects or elements or devices of the text. There are certain texts I come back to over and over again. They are just so beautifully crafted. And I may be looking for things about them um, uh, initially. Uh, I might be looking for one particular thing but then I come back to it six months, a year later, and I think, wow, there was all that stuff in it and I didn't notice. Uh, and I can sometimes see how that influenced my writing, either in the um, structure, well, I'm structuring sentences, paragraphs, my ideas, maybe the metaphors I'm using um, in my writing and in my speech. Uh, and I can start to pull out how has that mentor text influenced me? But what you need to be doing, and I suggest maybe um, putting it together uh, in if you've got access to your own computer, um, is that you start to build up files of texts under different folders. So if you're, um, I think um, Sue was talking about, uh, maybe it was someone else, sorry, talking about 
dialogue, then find really good examples for yourself of uh, dialogue. And dialogue that's gripped you and really made you think, wow, I can hear that conversation going on. I'm eavesdropping on that conversation. You've probably all read, and, and maybe some of you, this is what you're grappling with, with in your writing, dialogue that's clunky or it's contrived or it's just not believable. It, this is one of the things we find really difficult with um, young adult novels and novels and writing for children. Children have such fantastic BS meters, they can spot fake dialogue a mile off. And so we have to serve up the best dialogue uh, to our readers. So uh, let's have a look at the next slide. Oh, I've worked out how to do it. So when you're looking at a mentor text, take note of your first impressions. What jumps out at you from the get-go? And as a writer, you need to be thinking about initially going with your gut. So if you like the way something sounds or it causes you to really react strongly, think about why are you reacting so strongly to it now? It may be that it's particularly badly written. That's not a mentor text. Flick that aside. But if you find something and you just think, oh, I wish I had written those words or I wish I'd come up with that character or I want to be in that setting, you know, this is the life I want to be living, um, grab onto that because that is an example of a great mentor text. And even if it's not the greatest literature in the world, if it speaks to you, you can learn from it. And if you keep building up this process of using mentor text, you'll find that your um, reading, you, you become a more insightful reader yourself, which will make you a more powerful writer. Uh, I'm going to leave the rest of the notes um, on that because you probably... Um, read ahead anyway. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is, I think, let me just see. Oh, okay, so I've spoken briefly about the specifics. Always have a goal in mind. Why have you chosen that particular mentor text? And be as specific as you can in identifying what it is that's so um, powerful. Now, What's going to start happening for you is the more you work with mentor text, the more you will notice. And, the, and I guarantee you, the better your writing will become. So think about um, revisiting your mentor text, uh, as I've, I've said before. Be prepared to push yourself as well. You, so be uh, have the courage to seek out those great writers that some of us aspire to be and dare to dream. You know, I, I would love to be able to write like Philip Pullman. I would love to be able to write like Glenda Millard. I would probably give my left knee to be able to craft worlds like Margot Lanigan. Probably not ever going to happen. Uh, but the more I read those writers, the more likely I am to have absorbed their ideas and be influenced by sitting at the feet of these wonderful writers. Okay, so let's have a look. I think at this stage what I should do is give you an example of a um, mentor text. Uh, I might come back to that. So now I'm going to push escape and get out. And now I'm going to show you. So I'm going to start with this um, poem. Now, hopefully, Scott, can you let me know if this is big enough? Uh, I might just make it a bit bigger. Um, 
Oops. Just trying to make it a bit wider. Oh, maybe I'll just. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Oh, good. Scott can see it. Terrific. So I have no idea how to make the screen go. This oh, here we go. Look at this. Oh, and she centers the text. Yay, and kicks a goal. Okay. So this is um, by Lorraine Marwood, who I mentioned before. She's um, a fabulous poet and she writes um, wonderful um, poetry novels as well as novels. And um, this, it, her background is uh, she was a dairy farmer for many decades. She's raised five or six children. She's um, moved to Bendigo about 15 years ago. That's where I live. Uh, and I've got to know her luckily uh, and she's just the most wonderfully generous writer. And this is a poem that I've used uh, really for the last 10 or 11 years because I, I get so much out of it every time I read it. So I'm going to uh, mutilate this poem now for you by reading it to you. It's called Plague. These two plagues have I seen, said the boy. Grasshoppers that came like a green battle coat, flung from an enemy, helicopter, churring, churring. And in the time it takes to cut your lunch, that clover paddock of ours was gone bare. The plague had gulped the green, then whirred and churred till it gained wings and flew dragon style, spouting green smoke. Snow, I have seen, spokes of snow, brittle with summer grass, seed heads that rolled like tractor wheels, softly moving in clots, like little flocks of sheep moving until caught in our machinery shed or carport or veranda or along the fence or around the roses, even in the dog kennel, pushing and jostling like trapeze artists, blow weed making escalators of spiky seed until every bit of the farmhouse and farm sheds become blurry and think in a summer snowstorm. These two plagues I have seen, said the boy. Okay, if, if I'm um, working in a classroom setting, normally what I ask people to do is um, give me their instant gut reactions um, to that poem or to any piece of text that I'm working with. So I don't know if people want to um, uh, type some responses onto the screen about things that jumped up out at them. <laughs> Bonnie, play the visuals, wow. Yes, okay. So Bonnie, what you've identified is the way Lorraine has been able to create this incredibly visual scene for us. When I first read that, I felt like I was in an art house film clip, a very short film, because her writing is so visual. And uh, she's so clever because it's um, exactly, Nadia, her, the musicality of her writing is extraordinary. And her use of metaphor and other literary devices are amazing, but it's, I still find it a very accessible poem. And I think that's a really difficult thing to do, write in a, in a literary way um, and to use lots of clever devices, but do it in a way that the reader feels that they're um, safely cradled by the writer because they know they can trust that the writer is going to take them on this amazing journey. So um, Scott uh, um, Desmond has talked about the unusual syntax of have I seen. It, it does have a surprising effect. So maybe one of the things that you want to be thinking about in your writing is the surprises. Uh, so I think going back to Sue's 
question about pace. You're writing the story at a breakneck speed. What's one of the ways to really slow a reader down? Chuck in a few surprises. Stop and think about, can you turn your, um, your syntax style around? Mix it up a bit. Uh, throw something in that we wouldn't nor if, if this is if you're writing uh, prose, that we wouldn't normally put in a prose paragraph that we would expect to see in a poem, but when you throw it in, a little bit like a firecracker into a, into a paragraph, if it's well placed, obviously if it's just gimmicky, don't do it. But if it's well placed, it will stop the reader in a number of different ways. They'll either say, hang on a sec, that's not the way I thought that text was going to go, and I have to stop and go back and consider that text again. Or it may be that they've been reading along, it's getting a little bit ho-hum, and they're, you know, when you read and you're sort of nodding a little bit, and then all of a sudden, that little firecracker you've thrown in brings you back and keeps you on track with your reading. And then you know as a writer, I've done a fantastic job because I, those little squiggles on the page have grabbed my readers and given them a bit of a shake. Um, Scott's talked about, yeah, yeah. Um, Trevor suggested that the poem has a World War I feel about it stuck in adversity. And that's a really insightful comment to have made, Trevor, because uh, when Lorraine wrote this, she's, uh, they were making the decision to get out of dairy farming and come off the farm and, and move into the provincial city that is Bendigo massive decision for anybody to make um, and that's one of the things I really love about her writing. She's someone that writes for children and young adults about the experience of growing up in a non-city um, setting and we, we, we don't see as much of that as we, um, well, I think we should. We used to see a lot of those rural settings in books for young adults and children, uh, but at sort of around the 70s, we, we stopped seeing that. Um, and people that live in the country, we still need to read and we still need to see our lives reflected. So not everything needs to be based in the city. So that sense of the adversity comes very much out of the farmer's struggle with the land and with nature. Uh, Linda's talked about the use of the language word, churred, were and churring. Uh, and you're exactly right uh, that it is powerful and it does set the tempo because she has used that device of repetition. Um, and, um, oh, narrative traction. Oh, I have to use that term, Bonnie. Thank you. I haven't heard that term before. Um, softly moving in clots like little flocks. So Nadia, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. If that's spoken to you, then maybe that's the sort of um, thing that you're working towards in your writing. Perhaps you're writing some quite lyrical text, uh, quite musical text. And so reach out in the same way that when, when we hear songs and they become earworms and often um, we have a, a line that or a musical phrase that goes over and over again in our brains, this is what mental texts are for us. They're like our sort of brain worms. They get in there and if we listen to them enough, we can learn from them. Um, Jessica's talked about... Uh, the analogy with the helicopter and enemies. So I think the other thing that um, is really terrific about this mentor text um, is she's really, if we stopped and identified, uh, I probably could highlight it on here, but I, I won't learn how to do that in front of you all now. Um, 
she's thrown in a whole lot of metaphors and different um, devices. So she's got repetition, she's got um, uh, what's, uh, um, alliteration in there, um, she's got um, hyperbole in there, uh, she's got um, similes. So now in the hands of a less talented and less masterly writer, that would just be a hodgepodge of ideas. But somehow she's found that through line. And her through line is the plagues. And she's going to tell you in the first stanza about one particular plague and in the second stanza about another. Uh, and you can see the plague of grasshoppers and um, uh, the plague of that um, tumbleweed um, that you know can stack up to uh, in the country. If you've ever seen it before, it can stack up to a, a, um, one story or two story high. And people get trapped in their houses. It's just a nightmare. Um, but but instead of doing that really pedestrian description that I just done. Look how beautifully she's been able to craft that into a piece of writing, uh, and it's a it's a short, sharp, quite a snappy piece of writing. It's not. I don't find it sentimental, even though it is. It is heavy with melancholy. If you read between the lines, the melancholy of um, a young boy who clearly. Uh, you know, it, the fact that he's talking about them as being plagues, and I do apologise for the um, misprint on the page. Um, but for a boy, you know, that, that sense of, wow, how old is that boy? Is it his farm or is it a friend's farm? Why has he thought to use that word about grasshoppers and that tumbleweed stuff? Plague is an incredibly... Um, laden word uh, it's a it's a very emotive word and and as we all know no words are there by accident everything we put in our stories and our uh, pieces of writing whether they're non-fiction or fiction everything is there for a reason and it's there because of an, an authorial decision um, that you've made okay so um, so poetry is, is fabulous. Okay, I want to stick with the idea of um, uh, setting and, and the lyricism of creating setting. And this time I'm going to pull out for you. Now, you might need a box of tissues here. Um, because this is a short story called Singing My Sister Down by Margot Lanigan and it was originally published in a collection of short stories that she wrote called Black Juice. Uh, it was part of a whole series that Alan and Unwin did, uh, White Time, Red Shoes, uh, yellow Cake, uh, and it's since been republished in her latest collection of short stories. Uh, the name escapes me, um, but it's just go on her website and, um, and grab it. Now, I'm using this with um, permission. Uh, so, singing my sister down, I'm just going to read the first part to you. Um, you can get, I, I'm not able to leave this PDF up for you, but I suggest either go and look in a secondhand bookshop and buy yourself a copy, or you can, uh, I've, I've seen PDFs of this online, legally online. I'm sorry, I uh, don't have the, the link for you, um, but I've listed this story um, in the resources slide at the end of this webinar. Um, okay, so singing my sister down. We all went down to the tar pit with mats to spread our weight. 
Icky was standing on the bank, her hands in a metal twin loop behind her. She'd stopped sulking. Now she looked more starey and puzzled. Chief Banandra pointed to the pit. Out you go then, girl. You must walk on out there to the middle and stand. When you picked a spot, your people can join you. So Ick stepped out, very ordinary. She walked out. I thought, hoped even, she might walk right across and into the thorns the other side. At the same time, I knew she wouldn't do that. She walked the way you walk on the tar, except without the arms balancing. She nearly fell from a stumble once, but Mama hallooed to her and she straightened and walked a straight upright line out to the very middle, where she slowed and stopped, not looking back. Mama didn't look to the chief, but all us kids and the rest did. Right then, she said, Mama stepped straight out as if she just herself that moment happened to decide to. We went out after her, only us, X family, which was like us being punished too. Everyone watching us walk out to that girl who was our shame. In the winter, you come to the pit to warm your feet in the tar. You stand long enough to sink as far as your ankles. The littler you are, the longer you can stand. You soak the heat in for as long as the tar doesn't close over your feet and grip. And it's as good as warmed boots wrapping your feet. But in summer, like this day, you keep away from the tar because it makes the air hotter and you mind about the stink. But today we had to go out and everyone had to see us go. Icky was tall, but she was thin and light from all the worry in prison. She was going to take a long time about sinking. We got our mats down, all the food parcels and ice buckets and instruments and such spread out evenly on the broad planks Dash and Felly had carried out. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got chills just reading that. Um, okay, reactions. Uh, yeah, Jake, I'm with you. Um, Jake read this story years ago, not even sure uh, if I can sit through it again. Such a powerful story. I'm with you, Jake. Um, Rosamond, um, Rosalind uh, Price, who was then the, the um, uh, publisher at Allen and Unwin, handed it to me and I was jumping on a train to go back to Bendigo. And she said, oh, you're going to love this collection of short stories. And Singing My Sister Down, I think from memory, is the first story in the collection. And I sat there on the train from Melbourne to Bendigo and wept and just shivered. I couldn't put it down. I was so embarrassed I was reading it in public, but I just I, I couldn't close um, the page on that story until I'd got to the end of it. And it doesn't end well, I have to say, and that's not a spoiler because you can see where it's going from the start. Um, yeah, so Yvonne can smell the tar. Tessa has already felt the punishment. Tessa has no idea what Ick has done, um, but it's a me too story actually when you think about it. Uh, but already, and I've only read you, what, 20, 20 lines, 20 sentences. How powerful is that? You could just leave it at that, and sadly I'm going to. Um, Ash is hooked. I want to read the rest. <laughs> I've never read this story before. Um, sorry, Ash, I'll completely understand it if I see you've gone on uh, offline now um, and you've, you've, you're off to, to find it. Um, but that to me is an example of I've just given you a taster of uh, one of uh, look I think this is the finest thing Margot's ever written and she's written some pretty amazing stuff I am happy to stand up and argue that this is one of the finest short stories ever 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 written she may have written it for young adults but I tell you what lots of adult short story writers would kill to be able to write as powerfully as she does as a short story writer. 
uh, and for any of you who've tried to write short stories, they are really, really hard to do. Writing shorter stuff, I think, sometimes is even harder than writing the long stuff. Um, uh, I can't see Linda saying, I love this story so much. Oh, good, you love all of Margot's books. Um, it's all the more horrific for the beauty of the language and the innocence of the narrator. Spot on, Linda. Couldn't have said it better myself. So then, Linda, for you, you've got these books. Get out your highlighter and your sticky notes and whatever else. I'm a great believer in... Um, let me show you one of my books. Um, when I really love something, you can see... Um, that I'm just writing all over the text. Oh, no, I've been very good. Oh, no, here we go. I'm writing all over the text and annotating it, pulling out what can I learn from the text, what can my students learn from it, how can my writing get better. Uh, and, um, and I think it's really important then when you're writing, that, that, that when you're reading something, don't just stop and think, oh, yeah, that was really good. But really be really specific. So I'm just going to be a little bit tangential. Tangent. I'm going to go off on a tangent now. This is a book called Hexen House by Nikki McWaters, one of my favourite reads from a couple of years ago. Um, and it's the story of three young women caught in the hysteria of their own times. So it's about witch hunts. You can see I read really weird stuff. Um, so it's 1628 and Veronica and her brother flee for their lives into the German woods after their father is burned at the stake. Nice little bedtime reading. Um, at the dawn of the 18th century, Scottish maid Catherine is lured into political dissent after her parents are butchered for their beliefs. In present-day Australia, Paisley navigates her way through the burning torches of small-town gossip after her mother's New Age shop comes under scrutiny. So very clever, sort of not exactly time slip, but and young adult, but all the adults I've shown Hexen House to um, have loved it. I just want to, to read you something from here. Um, Barger and House, so this is his terrible house, um, Hexen House, this terrible house where all this, this horrible torture of witches goes on, was the, sheep, was the seat of the Shaw family. The mansion stood three stories high, nested with attic rooms and annexed by some inferior cottages and working buildings. And what I've, what I've um, annotated there is she's set up the family well uh, and she's... Um, she's clearly indicated that it's not a castle and it's very important that you understand the hierarchy of the, of the, fa of the families in this story. Um, and then she goes on and she says, the whole compound was enclosed by a wall of some fortitude that may have offered defence during the many years of religious warring that had only recently brought the Reformation and shifting power at state level. It sat atop a hill and looked out over the paddocks tenanted by the local farmers. Now, you can see, you can't read it, but you can see it. Oh, dear. Here we go. The paddocks tenanted by the local farmers. What I've said is that paragraph, you need, you need to have background knowledge if you're a young reader. But if you're writing for adults, that is an, in, a, an incredibly dense paragraph, lots of setting up of the, um, the setting uh, and, and lots of um, sort of foregrounding what's going to come next. And, but it's been done in a way that... Instead of that description going on for pages and pages and sending the sleeper, sending the reader to sleep, it's really distilled down into quite short, snappy uh, writing, even though it's quite dense. Um, now, um, Desmonda said, just going back to, um, oh, thanks, Jessica, you've found it. 
um, and you've put the link to Singing My Sister Down. Fabulous, thank you. Um, uh, Desmond has said uh, that writing like this has to be from experience, doesn't it? I mean, only a great talenter can render it this way and we don't know how much fiction is mixed with experience. Again, fabulous. Oh, I wish my students at uni were this insightful um, or disinterested. Um, it, yes, she she is. She was probably born brilliant, but she's gone on getting more brillianter. But the point is, we've all got it in us, and even if we've all got just writing one brilliant sentence or one amazing paragraph or drawing one extraordinary series of um, uh, one of those things called cartoons, we've all got it in us. But sometimes we need to stop and say less really is more. Let's take our writing to that next level. But obviously, there are times when you, you've gone as far as you can with that um, piece of writing. It's like when, when your carry-on um, suitcase or, or worse, the, the suitcase you use when you're um, travelling uh, on buses and trains and all the rest of it, and it starts to get ripped and torn and dirty and the wheels fall off. Sometimes our writing is like that. It's like an old suitcase. We can't do any more with it. We've patched it up, we've re-edited it, we've used masking tape, duct tape, wire, goodness knows what. We need to put that down and we need to get a new suitcase. We need to start on a new piece of writing. We can still take elements of that old piece of writing and learn from it. Sometimes we have to start again. But for some of you, I would argue, you can go further with that piece of writing that you're working on at the moment or pull out that, that piece of writing that you've got in your top drawer or your bottom drawer, wherever you keep your pieces that you're not working on at the moment. Go back and see having read mentor texts and really analysing them and diving into them and mining them for, for everything you can get out of them, how can you then go back and reflect on your own writing? And I can see from the comments um, that you're um, putting up on screen that you're all reflecting back um, on your own writing. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I, I agree that um, there are elements of black juice that are very Margaret um, Atwood. Um, okay, oh, Danielle, how do I find the comments? Mm, which comments would they be? Um, just ask the question again and I'll answer it. Okay, so let's have another one. Now, this is the one um, that I'd like to spend, oh, I think, have I only, have I got five minutes left? Hmm. Not very good on timing. Uh, let me just close that behind. Okay, so this is from a book that I've only just started reading this week, but already I, I, I think it's going to be one of my favourite reads of the year. It's called The Peacock Book, The Peacock Detectives, and it's by Carly Nugent, or Nugent. And it was shortlisted for the text prize. So for those of you who know about text publishing, fantastic, um, fairly small, well, maybe medium small, independent Australian publisher, going great guns, doing amazing things. And every year, they have the text prize, which is uh, a, a writing competition for novels for um, young people. And the winner of the prize is published and in the following year and receives um, an advance. Um, uh, oh, Harriet's saying up for questions at 12.30. I'm absolutely up for questions, Harriet. If people would like to, they can just go off and read Margot if they don't want to answer questions. Um, okay, so um, let's spend some time now with the Peacock Detectives. 
I got so excited about this book when I came across it uh, or when it was sent to me for review um, that I contacted um, text straight away, the lovely Alice Lewinsky at text, and because it doesn't come out till May the 28th, and I don't think it's May the 28th yet, uh, there was a there's a publication embargo and and she has given me special permission to to use this with you today which is why it's going to disappear from the screen pretty shortly but I'm sure you're going to want to read this book and I just have to do this to you look at that beautiful flaring oh I'd love a bit of foil on the cover okay um, so the peacock detectives so this is the premise of the book the last time the peacocks disappeared Cassie found them sitting on a coiled hose behind the fire station and Dad called her Cassie Anderson, peacock detective. So this time she knows what to do. She'll look for the clues, write down all the important details in her notebook for noticing and track them down. But the clues lead her in unexpected directions and Cassie finds herself investigating a puzzling mystery about her family, searching for a missing friend and facing her worst fear. And in the middle of it all, she is working how to be a writer. So what I love about um, this book, and I haven't even finished it, that's how much I love it, is that it's a, it's a very um, self-referential book. So as she's um, um, uh, sorry, I'm just reading Danielle's questions. Um, how do you see everybody else's comments, Danielle? I think on the on your right hand side you'll find some questions, and if you just scroll down, and that's what I'm doing, sort of scrolling up and down, trying to keep track track of um, um, of the writing. Um, okay. So let's have a look at, so this is chapter one uh, and it's, it's come very kindly um, from the editor. So I don't have to, I did offer to retype it, but you know, she said, no, 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 go and clean your kitchen instead. Um, okay, so let's spend some time with this. Today would have been an ordinary Saturday, except that two things happened. Number one, the peacocks escaped and number two, I started writing this story. Dad says if you want to write a story, you should start by choosing a topic that you know a lot about. That's why this isn't a story about France, which I know a little bit about, but not a lot. And it isn't a story about my big sister, Diana, who I used to know a lot about. But now that she is 14 turning 15, I don't know anymore. This is a story about peacocks. I know a lot about peacocks because A, two peacocks live in the holiday flats across the road from me and B, I'm good at finding them when they go missing. I'm good at finding things because I'm good at noticing details. For example, in February, mum was trying to make apple crumble and she couldn't find the cinnamon. I went through the cupboard and sniffed everything and found it in a jar labelled cumin. And last year when Diana lost her new bra, I noticed some dirt on my dog, Simon's nose, which meant that he had been digging. I found Diana's bra in a hole under the bay tree. I guess Simon doesn't like Diana being 14 turning 15 either. Dad says that if you want to be a writer, you have to be good at details because details are what colour the pictures in people's head when they read. I keep all my details in my notebook for noticing, which Dad gave me for my birthday last year. Here are some examples of the things in my notebook. Silver beak for dinner tonight, sad face. Diana was on her phone for three hours today. Dad is yawning a lot. Mum made lamingtons. Dad also says that a story has to have an inciting incident at the beginning. An inciting incident is something that happens to get the story started, like a problem that has to be fixed or a mystery that has to be solved. And the inciting incident for this story is that the peacocks escaped and Mr and Mrs Hudson came over to ask for my help. Okay. Um, 
Um, so, oh, thanks for clearing that up, um, Harriet and um, M. about, yeah, the, sorry, you can't see the comments, I can, which is why I'm reading them, reading them out. Oh, should I? Maybe I shouldn't be doing that, Harriet. Oh, dear. Um, yes, it does have that same curious feel. Uh, of, of the curious incident of the dog in the night time. Fantastic, Bonnie, you're hooked already. Watch out for it when it when it comes out. Um, so, um, oh, that's great. I'd like that, that um, the Writer Centre is transparent. I'm very transparent too. Um, okay, so I think you can see I'm a little bit excited about this text. It's a text for the the younger end of um, young adults. So I would be um, getting my year seven students and even precocious year fives and sixes to read this, but I'd also be using this with older readers um, who find reading difficult um, because it is so good at um, taking story structure and writing advice and writing it in to the book using the device of this really naive narrator. Now, she's not an unreliable naive narrator. It turns out that she's, she's actually quite um, smart and very good at noticing as she's told us. And she's, she's a, a precocious, um, person. Um, but one of the things um, that made me realise that um, uh, I was going to really enjoy this book was um, four or five lines in. Um, Dad says, if you want to write a story, you should start by choosing a topic that you know a lot about. Now, you all know that as um, beginning emerging writers, uh, but you need to start, uh, and, it, and even if it's just the, the sort of um, the practice aspect of writing every day, but you're writing about stuff you know, you're not starting too big. Your story can grow into something really big. Um, uh, and I can remember when I was, um, oh, how old is the narrator? Uh, that's a very good question. The narrator is probably about um, 11, 12 maybe. Um, doesn't actually say in it, um, but that's what what I would expect. Now remember as, as authors, you can make your um, your narrators as intelligent, uh, observant, narcissistic, thick as you want. Um, that's your choice and uh, and one of the things that I've learned from the great writer John Marsden is that decide where on the uh, continuum of um, awareness and wisdom your narrator sits and then decide do you want them to reach complete awareness by the end of the book? That's not terribly believable. How far along the continuum are you going to shift them? If you're doing a series of books, obviously you don't want, well, maybe you do. I don't know. I've never written a series of books. But I don't imagine you want your character get to get from the middle of the continuum to the end in the first book. You probably want to do it in the third book um, or if you're like someone like John Marston, maybe you want to do it in the fourth book of your trilogy that goes on to have about seven or eight books in it, like Tomorrow When the War Began, um, which, you know, as we all know, is one of the, the most successful and riveting reads for young adults, and I would say adults as well, that's been written um, by an Australian in the last 20 or 30 years. Okay. Um, Yes, John Marsden is good. So, yeah, I agree. Um, so what you can do, and, and, and I, I suggest that
that you um, use books like this that are self-referential because what they do is they expose the bones of the writing process, but they do it in a way that is, it will feed your soul more than just reading a self-help manual by uh, an author. And probably for those of you who do uh, use self-help manuals, and I've got a number of them as well, the ones that I really love are the ones where I could feel the author's voice coming through. It's not just that they've got great tips in them and exercises and things to do, but it's as if I'm spending time with that author just as it is when I'm reading one of their books. I'm sitting there with them, I'm inside their head and I'm understanding the way they think. So I think this is, and for that reason, I imagine this book is going to do um, very well. Okay, so let's have a look um, at some of the, the things I, I think that she is doing well and perhaps, perhaps um, chip in some other um, comments as we're going along and I'll read them out. So um, Scott suggested that this book is also like Wild Mind by Natalie Goldberg. I don't know that one, but um, fabulous. I'm looking forward to going and looking that one up. Um, that's the other thing that you're automatically doing and what every reader does. You start to see what we call text to text connections. And that's a really important thing for authors to do. And I notice it very much at the moment. It's becoming, um, at the moment, it's almost a little bit too flavour of the month, but the, but the writers who are doing it well um, are doing it brilliantly well. They are, in one book, they're referring to another one. So another fantastic mentor text uh, for that is, I'm going to go mental blank now, White Knight, and it's written by, I can see her, she's got gorgeous blonde curly hair, Kirsty Murray, I think, Someone correct me on that. Ellie Marnie, sorry, 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 sorry. They are friends. Um, thanks, Jessica. Um, Ellie Marnie wrote that one. White Knight is fantastic because Ellie is an English teacher and so she writes really believable English teacher characters and there are a lot of very unbelievable English teacher characters out there. I know I'm an English teacher. Some of the things they write, they're not accurate. Get your stuff accurate. So find um, books like that, use them as mentor texts. She also does dialogue with young people really, really well. Um, okay, so um, yeah, uh, here's another comment. Um, these first two cute pages, they're quirky and they're unpacking as this preteen talks more. And what we start to see as the book goes on is we get, obviously, we, we already know um, heaps of stuff about uh, the, the narrator just from those first two pages. And that's another thing. To me, another aspect of this being such powerful writing is when you're introducing a character, uh, it's really hard not to front load all that character description before you even get to the story. You need to um, sort of unroll it for your readers. It's almost as like when you meet someone for the first time, you either do or don't have prior knowledge about that person and then you meet them and they make a first impression but then what you know about them, it unfurls and you might learn it from them, from what they say, from the way they act. You might learn it from seeing them, observing them from a distance. You might learn it from uh, the way other people react to them, hearing stuff about them. So think about all of that in your story or whatever it is you're writing. So for me, this is a really good example of characterisation because Carly Nugent hasn't given us a big solid, you know, th this is how the story has started. We've jumped right in to the middle of the story. 
there's a whole lot of backstory that we know will be um, um, unfolding for us throughout the story, but we're right in the middle of the action and we're hooked um, from the start. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to just draw your attention to uh, foregrounding. I love foregrounding. I think it's a um, it's a wonderful device to use, um, but it's really hard to get it right. Uh, and here, in, sorry, I'm scrolling up and down. Down. Um, right. So this is the examples of things in my notebook. Silver beak for dinner tonight. Diana was on her phone for three hours today. Dad is yawning a lot. Mum made lamingtons. To me, this is what she's done here in these four short sentences or four short um, entries into her notebook. I like the dreaded multiple choice question. Couple that are, you know, bit boring, one completely off the track, and then the right answer, but it's disguised. The foregrounding is dad is yawning a lot. Now we know from the, um, the book, the back of the book, that uh, well, the blurb, that's what that's called. <laughs> I know some technical language, I just can't remember it. Um, that uh, this is a story about um, investigating a puzzling mystery about her family, searching for a missing friend and facing her worst fear. Now, for me as a reader, knowing that this is a, um, a young adult book and thinking back to when I was a young adult, um, my worst fears included people dying, uh, families separating and I suspect that there's might be some of that in this book and I haven't read far enough into it to say that it's a spoiler but if it is look how clever it is that she's just planted that tiny little thing and if you go back and reread the story you'll say oh it was there all along now that might not I might be misreading this maybe the foregrounding is that mum made lamingtons. Maybe that's going to be an incredibly important line in the story, but I suspect that it's not. However, I also suspect that Diana was on her phone for three hours today is also going to be really important. Um, so be thinking about um, with your, um, your stories and, and whatever else you're writing, because uh, you need to do this for non-fiction writing as well, think about are you foregrounding enough so that you're pulling your readers through your writing. Okay, I'm going to um, uh, clear that and I'm going to show you, looking at time, 12.30. So we're finishing in 15 minutes, is that okay? Um, and then I'll take some questions. Um, oh, no, I'm going to take questions now. Uh, let me just flash, we're not going to go through these, but I just want to flash up a couple of other ones just to show you, and then I'll take some questions. Um, Seashores and Shadows by Colin Tearley. I cannot, cannot, cannot um, recommend highly enough <coughs> A, that you read the best young adult and the best children's books and use them as mentor texts because adult books that are in the adult canon, yes, you will learn extraordinary things from them, but when you're starting to use mentor texts, it's much easier to use really well-crafted young adult and children's novels and picture books uh, as your mentors because, as Scott will know, um, being a, one of Australia's most popular writers, um, you do not have time to muck around. If you want to grab those young adult readers, they're going to stick with you for a chapter at most. Most of them will have turned off by the first page. Whereas 
people who are reading adult books and they've invested in that money, uh, invested their own money in that book, they're probably going to stick with the book for much longer. Children and young adults, they don't feel any allegiance to that book. You have to be the sort of writer that is going to make them swear allegiance to you as a writer and want to stick not only with this book, but with the next book that you've got coming out as well. Um, so Colin Tealy, I love his writing. Writing, It's very dense. It's very old fashioned, but there's lots of stuff that we can learn um, um, for it. Um, um, the other um, thing to, I, I don't think you can go past um, Sonia Hartnett's writing as well. Um, the Silver Donkey, I, in my humble but very self-opinionated opinion, is perhaps as close to a perfect novel for young people that has ever been written. Similarly, her book Thursday's Child, I think it's called, uh, is absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and I learn so much from it every time I read it. Uh, and the last one I wanted to make mention of was you can't go past good old um, Owen Colfer's Artemis Fowl, which was a smash hit. Um, he's a great British um, writer. Uh, and Artemis Fowl is the classic anti-hero. Okay, so um, I'm... Um, just going to start looking through people's questions before I let you all go off. Um, so here's a comment. Um, so you said, I like that there is mystery right off the start, at the start for the two stories. Some literary stories have a lot of info dump. Yes, exactly. Maybe too much description and expositions. How much vagueness can you have? Um, I think Vagueness is not helpful for readers, but being vague and being obscure is fine. You know, think about it. There are some people in your life, you never, never quite know what's going on inside their heads, but you stick around long enough to find out because you know it's going to be interesting. That's what you have to do with your writing. Don't give everything away. You, you do need to have that element of um, uh, aloofness at times in your writing, but don't be so vague that your readers wander off. Um, thanks, Linda. She's left. She had to um, go. Uh, and I completely understand it if everybody else um, has to go. Um, but if you've got any other questions or um, um, comments you want to make, just type them in and I'll answer them as I can. Uh, you'll see on my, um, just while I'm um, waiting for these um, questions to come in, yes, you, um, Danielle, you will um, have the PowerPoint slides. Um, and Suya thinks that Artemis Fowl is almost perfect as a YA book. I would agree. What I really love about Artemis Fowl, and I um, um, use this a lot with really reluctant readers, um, is he is such an unlikable person. He's amoral. He's brilliant. He's wealthy. He's a pain in the backside. Uh, he's completely full of himself. He knows how brilliant he is. He's insufferable. But you cannot put the books down because you, you well, for me, I would just kept reading. I want him to get his comeuppance, and he does, but in, in ways that you're not expecting. Um, lots of um, young people that I've used it with have said this is bad writing because I hate Artemis Fowl and I say to them no 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 this is wonderful writing because how can those little black squiggles on a page make you get so het up about something take your pulse 
notice that your, your um, heart rate has gone up and it's only because Ian Colfer has written such an incredibly believable and revolting character. Um, oh, Bon <laughs> Bonnie's going to race out and um, buy the pe peacock detective as soon as it hits the shells. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So Ash is asking about how you organise your scrapbook of mentor texts. Yeah. Okay. So. The way I do it is that I set up folders um, on my computer and I, I, I have them under um, the consulting work that I do, um, but I have them in folders. So I have maybe a folder for setting, a, a folder for characters. I've got one for dialogue, um, uh, uh, poetry, um, uh, metaphor, you know, all the different devices. So my suggest, suggestion for you is you might like to create almost like mood folders um, in the same way that people are, are using, um, and I've just started doing this, um, writing to music and creating a playlist to write um, to write against. Um, use those mentor texts. So if you know you're writing um, something, um, thanks, Gillian, lovely to have you there. Um, uh, if you're writing, um, maybe you want to have a crack at blogging or you want to have a crack at um, writing um, a play or, you know, screenplay or you want to have a crack at, um, anyway, whatever it is, determine what that form or the genre is that you're writing and then find as many different examples as you can. And my suggestion for finding those is um, obviously you use uh, Victorian Writers' Centre. Um, I find Goodreads is helpful. I find um, Booktopia is really helpful. Readings, any of the big bookshops that, that have intelligent reviews that are more than just the blurb. Um, I listen to podcasts. Uh, I listen to um, Ozy, love Ozya and what they've got to say. I get on different countries, um, organisations and find out what's being shortlisted. I always follow the different prize shortlists and I at least, um, if I think it's a the sort of book that I'm trying to write myself, I'll Often they'll have a, a chapter, you can download a chapter, but the key to it is to organise it in a way that you can dip in and out of because um, just going back uh, to Ash's question, Ash, what you think you might be um, um, using a particular mentor text for now you may find five years down the track you want to use it for something else. So put it in a way that is accessible. Don't nest it um, away too much so that you can't find it again. Um, the other thing is that I that I do have, I, don't, I didn't bring them with me, but I do have physical scrapbooks of good examples that I keep as well um, because sometimes it's really good, well, especially when I'm working with, with um, children and secondary students, uh, it's good for me to be able to physically show show stuff, and that's why I've got you. You can't see it, but um, I bought um, from Bendigo this big bag of, st of books that I was going to talk through with you, um, but I've run out of time. Um, but that's the beauty of writing groups, and and if if you're not a member of a book club, I suggest you become a member of a book club and increase your um, reading repertoire. Okay. Um, there was another question from Joan. Is there good reading to help me enlarge a short story into a small novel? Yes. What I um, I, I can't think of it, of a particular um, one-off book. Um, other people may have um, 
ideas. What I can suggest though is often you'll find if you follow a particular author, they have taken an idea and they've developed it in different ways. So sometimes what they do is they will write, um, especially beginning writers, um, you'll see a story that was entered as, as a short story first and then they've developed it into um, a novel or what they've done is they've written um, a novel and then they've gone back and they've done a prequel, uh, not, not just a sequel. What I'd be doing is building up collections of those authors um, that have taken a particular theme and explored it in different ways. And if you read sort of around that idea of how do you get the through line from a, a, a short story into a small novel, you'll, you'll be able to read it and reflect on your own writing in that way. That's how I would be using it. Um, I think that's about it for questions. Um, oh, how do you compare screenplays and novels as mentor texts? I find dialogue better in screenplays. Yes, I agree because that's what they are. That they're designed not to be read, they're designed to be spoken. So what you need to be doing is make use of that and go into your dialogue in your, um, in your novel and really say, what can I cut away? Or what can I show in other ways? And one of the best ways to think about it is, um, if you um, go into um, older plays, go to your secondhand bookshop and find old books and old plays, flick open, find some dialogue, and you'll see how much pacier dialogue today is from dialogue that's written in the past. In a similar way, watch um, films, especially films for children from the past and you will find there's a whole lot more backstory that's included at the start, whereas now we think that children can't sit for long enough and um, concentrate on it. And a classic mentor text for me in, in that case is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and um, uh, Dr Doolittle, the old version, not the new version. Have a look at those two films and you'll see there's at least half an hour of fiddle faddling around before we get to the story. Now, these days kids won't sit still long enough for it but I would argue there's ways, they are beautifully made films and there's ways um, for you as a writer to keep your readers with you. You have to decide um, the pace of writing you're going to be. And people, you're, you're going to become known um, as, as, as a writer for the pace that you write at. So someone like Matthew Riley, who markets himself as being a really fast paced writer. I don't read him, not because I don't think he's good, but because I'm not, I don't like reading fast paced stuff. I like character driven, um, moody writing. I like my books to unfold slowly and, and I get to know them because I'm a very slow reader and I grieve when I get to the end of a book. So I like a book that takes me a long time to read because I get to spend time with them. But you may not want to be that sort of writer. Uh, you, you might want to be a pacier writer. Um, oh yeah, the ABC Book Club, fantastic um, for getting ideas. Um, uh, and I think that's it. Okay, enjoy reading Black Juice. Thank you. Yep, so I'll just click that off. Um, yep. Oh. Webinar for all. Yes, webinar for all.